We are here twice a week to help you to be that lawyer, someone who's confident, organized, and a skilled rainmaker. And I have uh, Randa waiting in the in the in the wings here. How you doing, Randa? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Just got back from my trip to Boston. Got to see Margaret Burke. I got to see Steve Seckler. Um, it was uh, I was almost very close to seeing Jared Korea, and then he he was whole family was sick, so that was out. But um, but Boston's a beautiful city. Have you been to Boston? I haven't. I was recently talking with someone, and they said they're from there. Um, it was over email, so I was like, "Do you have an accent?" They're like, "No, not unfortunately." It's like a hit and miss. But that was like my best big first question. <laughs> yeah, beautiful city, very clean, and uh, just a lot to a lot to see in a couple of days. Um, hey, everybody! You know we love to start with the with the quote of the show. We've got a very straightforward one, uh, Randa, that you gave to me. We I think we kind of tweaked this a bit back and forth between. Be, be, you know, as far as what we're putting out here, but essentially the, the, the quote is no pain, no change. Um, you can lead a horse to water, can't make him drink. I mean, there's a number of things that lead to, you know, why maybe lawyers are slow to change, why people are slow to change. Do you want to expand on that? Yes. Um, just naturally working with attorneys specifically. I mean, this is across all businesses, but specifically attorneys, they, um, they have a hard time with change sometimes, but obviously they're, connecting with us in some way, they do realize they do need to make a change, but the most that we can do is provide the tools. We can't actually force them to do anything. So it's our goal to identify if people are open to that and if they're going to follow through because um, otherwise we're not able to help them. And yeah. um, it's really important for my business success that, you know, law firm owners and attorneys are open um, when seeking that, or it's not going to be helpful for anyone. Well, and I almost push people away. You know, I try to qualify people that are not going to participate at the highest level to just don't do it. Like just don't yeah. invest, don't put your time, money, energy in something if you're not willing to make the time, put the change in. Um, and so yeah. I'm almost like finding people at their breaking point where it's like, you have to kind of get them to the point where it's, it's, it's do or die or that it's just like, Hey, another year goes by like this. That's, that's not a good thing. That's not, that's not working for me and get them to sort of admit it verbally. Um, do you find that mm -hmm. that's, that's helpful getting people to that, to that, to, to that breaking point? Absolutely. Um, I do get people also that I do get some that are like, Oh, I'm, I'm slowing down. My law firm's typically slow during these months. I want to start working on it. And I have to reiterate, like it is a commitment. And even though you're slow, you need to make sure that you are committing to the process. Um, and, you know, do or die moment, make action. But when you're slow and you're kind of like, yeah, I should be doing this. Sometimes you tend to not prioritize it either. Yeah. So. yeah, It's gotta be important, you know, whether you're growing your book of business, whether you're trying to get organized within your firm and, and come up with processes. And we're going to be hitting a lot of that today. Um, all really, really critical stuff. So um, Randa, give us a little bit of your background because, um, and just so everyone knows, Randa Prendergast is an old friend of mine, CEO of Miss June, uh, Mrs. June Legal. And how long have we known each other? It's got to be, it's got to be five years, six years, something like that. We're close to that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We connected around the beginning of the pandemic. Okay. Okay. So, so in, in, you know, we're not doing the same things, but we're really both fully committed to helping attorneys and give us, give us the background and, and kind of where you started and, and how you ended up working in legal and doing what you do. Sure. So I'm a recovering paralegal. I used to work for a bunch of solos, mo mainly in family law. Uh, solos are my heart, my bread and butter. I love them so much. Um, I want to see them win. So I was used to wearing many hats, you know, doing paralegal work, also do, being the billing clerk, um, all the many hats in the law firm. Um, I decided to transition to contract support. And there was a huge need throughout the legal community for that type of work. There's a lot of flexibility for law firms there. Um, so I outgrew myself doing that work. I decided to help place paralegal support. Um, I, I soon realized I was not as successful with that as I wanted to be because um, law firms did not have processes in place. So my contractors didn't have the tools that they needed to be successful. So that's where it was um, I, my second part or leg of my business was born and doing legal consulting. We provide expert services and law firm and case processes 
um, including billing and billing clerk services. And we do implement um, implementation and training. Yeah. So really important. And, 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 you know, you got into that space because you saw, and similar to me, right, saw a deficit in an area. And why are, why are lawyers, and I'm not going to, you know, pick on them maybe more than I'd pick on anybody, but let's, but hey, why not, you know, when in Rome, uh, why are right. they so bad? With, why are they so bad with billing processes and AR and in some cases have 50, 100,000, I mean, a solo could have 50, $100,000 sitting out there that they need to like survive. And yet it, 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 it's, it's hard for them to collect. What's, what's good. Why, why are those things happening? Uh, lack of processes, lack of time, um, thinking uh, maybe they are too emotional in their billing and collections. That mm -hmm. happens a lot, especially uh, within probate family law. Um, some, specific areas, practice areas. I see that a lot. Um, maybe they also feel like they're not worthy of getting paid that much. Um, we, it's like a mindset issue a lot of times too. And um, they're always wanting to give exceptions, which I find is extraordinary because other areas or other businesses, there's just no exceptions, right? Yeah. Um, we, you know, they hear this time and time again, they, they don't get to go to the doctor or have their procedure without, you know, making payments. They don't get to go pick up their vehicle from the mechanic without paying their bill first. Right. But for some reason, attorneys offer a lot of exceptions. When you offer a lot of exceptions for payment and collection, um, then you end up with a lot of AR. Yeah. Um, and is that is that stemming from an issue about like the difficulty of talking about money? Like I know, you know, I'm in Gen X and like we didn't ask our parents, like, how much did you make? We didn't really talk money. They didn't talk money with us. So I know that there's people that have angst about having money conversations. Do you think that's a part of it? I think it could be for sure. But then also like when you're in law school, you don't talk about that portion. Like you don't talk about like how to run a business and you don't talk about collecting money and you don't you don't have those hard conversations like you do realize when you talk to a potential new client that you're going to be asking them for thousands of dollars up front so no one really knows how to form that conversation to where they sell they are selling themselves and are confident in that yeah so then so then what are what are the the mistakes that lawyers are making it could be on the front end during the engagement at the end of the engagement that's causing AR to pile up. What are like, I, I'm thinking I've got a few in my head, but I'd like to hear what you say and then I'll, I'll chime in. Sure. Clear communication at the beginning with your potential client of what it's going to cost uh, of what you charge hourly is going to be key. I always think that it's best to reiterate what billing or how you do your billing in the very beginning. So that starts on that very first consultation call. Like, we're going to collect at that $10,000 retainer for you. This is our frequency of billing. This is how you'll receive your bills. This is your expectation of uh, replenishing your retainer. Um, another good opportunity to put that information in front of the client again is, is reiterating it in your fee agreement. And then once they sign up, another opportunity for that is putting it in maybe a welcome letter of like how your office operates. So you have three opportunities right there to say, hey, this is how we're going to do billing. And you're setting that expectation from the beginning. Yeah. Um, I just came up with a, not a quote of the show, but I'm going to give this one to you. This is a freebie for you, Randa. You can take this, write it down. I'll put it in the show notes, whatever. But as you were okay. talking about how people make, ex how lawyers are making exceptions, I wrote down, you are not being exceptional when you make exceptions. Oh, that's a good one. Like that? Good job. Well, yeah, no, I that's do. a team effort right there. You and me, we can, we I can take it. credit for that together, but that's, that's, we, we think we're, you know, we're, we're by being the nice guy or gal and we're doing what we think is right for our clients, but it ends up, it ends up being now they, now they've, now you've set the precedent. Now you've set the tone mm -hmm. for I'm not exceptional or I'm not, uh, I'm not, you know, needing to be paid because I must be loaded or I must have you know, some, something going on in my favor when in fact there are attorneys that are in debt. There are attorneys that, that can't make their payments because they're sitting yep. on a, a pile of AR they can't collect. 
Well, and to that, like there's a perceived value of having set processes that you're not willing to go outside of for someone, right? And there's also perceived value in your pricing structure and, and your retainer collection. Mm -hmm. So um, you don't ever want to really be the lowest. That's perceived value of, you know, I need this money. I'll do whatever I need. You also don't want to offer all those exceptions because it's giving that same um, vibe to your potential new client. Yeah. So let's walk through the the life cycle of, of a client. Um, what are some things that we should be doing to set the tone at the very beginning when someone says, yes, I lawyer, I want to work with you or I'm going to sign this engagement letter? Is it something that needs to be said? Is it something that needs to be written in the engagement letter? What What are the things that sets the tone for the removal of the AR issue? Sure. So like I said, I think it needs to be three ways to communicate with them. Said during the conversation, reiterated during the in the fee agreement itself that they're signing, mm -hmm. and then in a welcome letter. If you... And then there's going to be other times throughout the life of the case that you're going to have these conversations, right? If you're saying to them, hey, we bill twice per month, then they should get a bill twice per month. So you're holding to that process from the very beginning. Some other things that really, um, you know, tell the client, these are our processes and we're adhering to them is having what I call billing um billing maintenance tasks, they're tasks that happen in between billing cycles. So you're not just sending them an invoice and just hoping that they pay, right? You're doing that follow-up in between saying, hey, here's your agreement that you say you're going to pay. And then you're also evaluating um, at some point, you know, stopping non-essential work to stopping essential work to withdrawing. And you're not letting billing cycles just pass you by without those conversations or those touch points. I mean, is it legit for lawyers to ask and receive ACH information and credit card information with the understanding that, you know, hey, when you get a bill, we'll just, we'll auto charge it as we go. Is that, is that happening? Should it be happening? Is that legit to do? Yeah, absolutely. The only thing that I want to caution about is um, you don't want to keep any of that information in written form. A lot of case management systems right. offer for that information to be stored securely. Yes. And then also look at the case management system or wherever it's being stored um, securely. So like Clio, for example, will store that information. But when the client checks the box, it just simply says we have the permission to use this payment information for our agreement. So you always want to put written agreement into your fee agreement if you're going to be running payments automatically um, through a payment plan or just when you're doing invoicing. And I just I just want to stop on that point with your with your caveat that it needs to be done um, in a secure way that mm -hmm. you can have all of your clients on ACH and credit card auto paying you with no AR at all because it's automated mm -hmm. again unless they shut down the card or shut down the the, the checking account that they have. Um, that's right. what I do. I only take one or two checks a month and uh, you know, that's on under protest. Um, and so my, you know, my bookkeeper, you know, th I, their job is still legit, but it's like their collections for me is, is almost zero. Yes. Yes. So um, when we set up billing processes, I always make that recommendation. Um, like I said, I, I will give the best, information and recommendations right but they have to put it in the process and a lot <laughs> yeah. of times I hear I get well my clients won't like that because and I'm like well you are setting the tone for what kind of clients you want too yeah. so um if you just say this is how we operate build it and they will come they people will hire you so make, make um, it a, make it a policy yeah. right Randa like tell everybody yeah. like this is our this is our like doctors do it all the time this is the policy yep. moving forward of how you're going to whatever, get information or access the doctor yep. or communicate or whatever. And we're like, okay, we just follow along. So I think yeah, it's we like, don't question it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. I mean, you just give it a, you know, give it a, don't just give it a try, make a decision that mm -hmm. this, that like processing checks is a very two, year 2000 thing to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's better ways. That's like scheduling appointments back and forth. Right now we all use autos, at least 
people should be using auto schedulers, but they're not. So they're spending right. how much time going back and forth? How does Wednesday look? Not good. Right. How does Thursday look? And we do this for what days? No, no right. more. You got to draw a line at some point. So to that, it, you know, people get discouraged when they're like, someone's like, oh, well, Smith and Smith, they don't do it that way. Great. Maybe they're a better fit for you, right? It's okay. Not everyone is going to be your client and you don't want them to be. Like if they're asking for exceptions out of the gate, they're probably going to be really big problems for you later. So, I'd, I'd say, um, wait, I got a better response. I'd say, well, they're not as smart of a law firm as we are. Yeah, you want to go, go with the smart law firm? You want to go with Ding. the dumb law firm? It's not taking money up front. <laughs> Ding. Yes, I'm absolutely. Terrible. I'm so, so I like it. But that's, but that's the thing is people get so wrapped up when they get turned down because they want to enforce a policy. But yeah. people who understand, you know, um, well, this is how everyone else operates. I'm going to operate this way with my attorney also. So it's not, um, you just have to put your foot down, yeah. really. So it's, it's, to. it's setting expectations, communicating mm -hmm. policy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what, what's happening? Enforcing. Yeah. You got to enforce the policy. That's yeah. where a lot of law firms like fall short, I think is they do all this heavy lifting in the front and then they're reviewing bills and they're not getting a replenishment on their retainer or, um, you know, they're not getting an invoice paid and they're continued to work or they're not doing a follow-up or due diligence for their law firm and their cash flow. So, yeah. I mean, think about it this way, everybody. It's, it's, I mean, I'm on ACH or credit card for everything. Every subscription I I have is all auto pay. I'm not, it's not like I'm not checking my accounts. Like I know what's going in and going out, but it's just, it's easier for everybody. You think it's, it's like, they're not going to want to do that. And it's in your head. Everybody wants to do, who wants to write a check to a mm -hmm. lawyer? Let me just, let me think right. about nobody. Let me take a second. Yeah. Nobody. All right. <laughs> what's easy now, granted, do they still want to like review their bill and all that? Yeah. I mean, I imagine they want to look at what's going on, you know, some of them, but ultimately as long as you're on the up and up and you've built that trust, you know, they have the ability to look at their bills and, and they can communicate this bill was more than I think it should be. And here's why, but then fine, then refund them something if you need to, or, or credit to the next month. But you, you have your right. money in the bank at that point and you can make adjustments. Yep. Yeah. And to that, like, I like to talk about billing cycles. I think uh, smaller or shorter billing cycles is really helpful, not only just for the law firm and cash flow purposes, but also it provides more consistency and communication to your client. Um, in legal billing, you know, it's very specific on what you're doing and you get to see all the activity descriptors and that's kind of like a mini update to your, your client what's going on in their case. So that also like provides better customer service. You know, they can see what you've done in the past two weeks instead of waiting for a month or whenever you get around to billing a month and a half, God forbid yeah. two months, right? Or longer. Um, it also provides smaller, more manageable payment. You know, they don't have to pay as much up front. So you should really, if you're going to do the retainer um, method, it should be a true retainer, evergreen retainer. Um, not collecting 5,000 and then having them replenish at one. It should be a replenishment to 5,000 every single billing cycle. It just makes the case more or the payments more manageable for your client. And then also it mitigates going into AR. When you have the smaller billing cycles too, one and a half billing cycles is when you're starting to have those conversations about, hey, do we need to stop work or do we need to withdraw from this case? You're not going more than that. So you're, it's about 30 days you're giving your client um, with a lot of reminders, right? To say, hey, this is, you sign up for this is how we operate we need to make sure that we get paid or maybe we're not good fit. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, it's so interesting that there are some lawyers that are working with no AR and there's lawyers that are having, you know, that have massive AR and there's a lot of obviously ways we're talking about it. What, what are you seeing as the, the firms that have no, like basically no AR, like what, what's, are they doing what I'm saying, like ACH and credit card? Are they doing that that auto replenish? Like, what's the key there? Sure, they just start consistent in their invoicing and they make decisions to withdraw. They take 
um, the, I, I think there is a lot of emotion and and billing and money and stuff. So they're taking that completely out. Um, mm -hmm. That's why we started providing billing clerks because uh, attorneys were too tied into their cases to say, oh, you know, Jane is going through this horrible custody battle and she doesn't have a lot of money. And so either cutting down their bill or not billing them enough um, or on a regular basis. So it's just consistency, but it takes a lot of time to be consistent. And then it's also hard conversations with your client when they're not doing holding up their end of the bargain. Yeah. And who's collecting? Is it always the attorney? Should it be the billing clerk? Like who should be calling the, the clients and getting the money? Because what I'm finding is that a lot of attorneys are, are killing their time chasing after the dollars yeah. and, and having those tough conversations. So absolutely. We want to remove their attorney from this process as much as possible. I only like to bring them in or making decisions about stopping work because of non-payment. Mm -hmm. So every all the tasks up until that point should really go to a legal assistant, admin, billing clerk, um, something of that sort. Not yeah. not even a paralegal. I bring in a paralegal just before the attorney to evaluate the case, just look at upcoming events, really. Um, like if there is a hearing or trial or if they're going to through discovery to kind of determine how important it is to get this full replenishment right? Because that's part of it too. Um, and then right before bringing in the attorney um, or yeah, so the paralegal then bring in the attorney finally. I mean, do attorneys feel like they have to make those those difficult phone calls because they have the relationship and it might be awkward if if someone else calls them to to talk to them about the 50,000, 100,000 that they might owe? Let's say it's a mid-market firm or something that they're, they're way behind. Yeah, I think so. And I think that they think the client's going to come with a lot of questions about why they are billed the way they build mm -hmm. were billed and that the attorney is the only person who can answer those questions, right? But it's really just taking a look at um, past invoices to see what kind of work's been done, right? Well, you were billed this because we were collecting discovery. You were billed this because we were preparing for a hearing on the state, right? It's not that hard to reiterate the things that have already been done and why they were done. Um, you know, after that, if there's some complex issue or if a client's like threatening for some reason, you know, we always rope in the attorney for that reason. They are the one who's has the name on the door. So, um, and we talk about how to uh, work through that. So some of those offerings, those like when you're trying to say, I say it's a collections workflow or past clients that owe you money, right? Um, a billing billing collections or uh, retainer collections is kind of you're still actively representing them and you're just trying to get paid on a regular basis. So a past collections workflow, you already represented them, the case is over. You want to consider, you know, like it, we usually do like a 90 day cadence of sending them in a, a, this is your final bill with a letter. Then maybe like if there's some pushback offering an automatic payment plan, right? That just runs automatically. Um, and then if there is even more pushback, even like a settlement amount or letter, depending okay. on what the attorney wants to offer. But in those scenarios, unless there's a big, I'm going to, there's something like I'm going to contact the bar or something like that. We keep the attorney completely out of it. Okay. So that's a note to everybody listening that, that things like bookkeeping and collections really shouldn't be done by you. There's there, those are the delegatable things that need to be done by professionals that, you know, aren't charging five, six, seven hundred dollars an hour. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Any any kind of we have time, I think, for one more tip, Rand. Anything jump out at you is one more thing that you'd love to share with everybody about about collections, AR, dealing with difficult people, maybe that's a good one. There's lots of difficult people out there. Sure. Sure. Um yeah. So if you know from a legal tech standpoint, just make sure all of your systems are talking to each other and we're minimizing manual labor. Um, a lot of attorneys, you know, have payment processing somewhere else aside from where they actually send out their bills. Okay. Um, and that causes a lot of, you know, human error or you get behind because you're not keeping up with those tasks. So you really want to find something that is, um, that works all together, whether it's the same system or, you know, leveraging legal legal tech and like zaps or something a third party to connect everything 
Okay. Um, but having a practice management system, a software that's handling the client, the case, the billing, everything all in one is probably the smart play. Yes, absolutely. And that helps too. Like if you want to bring in that outside VA admin or billing clerk, they yeah. have everything that they need in one spot to, to help you. And yeah. then they also can have the opportunity to look at, you know, we, we hire billing clerks that have legal, ex, you know, have worked in a law firm. So they are familiar with legal ease. And so they can review, um, you know, the matter, the case to answer the client's questions about things that have happened too. And this is your jam, right? Like helping lawyers not just collect, but like coming up with the systems and the processes and getting all this automated. So it's like they have no more AR. They have mm -hmm. every system in place to do all this. This is your jam. Absolutely. Yes, okay. it's my passion. I love yeah. it. Well, everybody, you've got a great resource here that you should be reaching out to if 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 you find yourself doing things that you absolutely should not be doing. And by the way, it's, it's negatively affecting you because your time is not only is not only poorly spent that way, but also you're not good at it and you're not, you're not using the systems. So um, awesome. Really great. And if we want to move uh, to, to kind of our final thing here, Randa, the, the uh, game changing book, and this has been brought up on the show for a reason. It's the go giver. Um, is that Bob Berg? Yes. Yes. Mr. Bob Berg. Okay. Mr. Bob. Berg. What's your yes. deal? Why do you like that book so much? You know, it was just so profound after I read it. I was like, there's so many different people in this space trying to help attorneys. There is no reason why um, we can't all help attorneys. And also, why not be able to give tips for free, right? That's why I do podcasts, because I'm like, you know, maybe there is that solo out there that is like, man, this is all awesome. But like, I can't even fathom paying someone right now this, but I just need to get started. Yeah. So it was just so profound to me to be like, not everyone is perfect for me and I'm not perfect for them. So I'm happy to refer and, you know, from a giving her. And then I'm also help, like happy to just point you in the right direction of information. Just so, um, you know, and then later, if you need help and you're in a better situation, we can come back and chat. Or maybe you can help me out just by referring my name. Just because I'm not ready for you right now doesn't mean someone else. So um, it's just amazing when, when you give what you can get back. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of the book and I'm a big fan of Bob Berg. I think if I, you know, and I've written a book on networking myself, you know, uh, called the attorney's networking handbook. The thing that I really love is I love being a giver. And we, I think you and I are on exactly the same page. The mistake and the misstep that I think people make is that they spend way too much time with people that, that are never going to reciprocate. And it's not that we, that we shouldn't help everybody. However, you also have to be respectful mm -hmm. of your time and you have Absolutely. to say, you know, there's a, a, someone who wanted to meet with me. And I basically said, look, I'm not going to, I can't have lunch with you. I'm too busy. I can do a 15 minute zoom. That's about it because I'm really focused on meeting prospective clients and strategic partners. That's how I spend my day. And I'm at seven yeah. to 10 meetings a day. So if you want me, you know, it's going to be in a bite-sized bit. You can't just say, hey, let's grab lunch because I've got this unlimited amount of time. So I think we have right. to be careful about our time uh, as we give and, and we give intelligently. Right. Absolutely. I completely agree. And that's yeah. why you do your podcast, right? And that's why you do other things. So yeah. they can, re you know, those people can refer to those, um, you know, outlets instead of taking your physical time. Right. Well, and also it's like, there's, there's, you know, limited amount of time that you have to network. If everybody wants to meet you, that's lovely, but ultimately you have a business to run. You have, right. you know, and every time you meet with someone, you try to give them one or two good contacts that takes time. So the math sure. doesn't work out for everybody to just be out there helping everybody selflessly a hundred percent of their day. We've got to, yeah. we've got to, you know, again, do it intelligently. So, um, sure. Randa, as we're wrapping up here, I want to thank our wonderful sponsors, uh, rankings IO, uh, that has this amazing pin uh, PIMCon coming up, uh, conference coming up. We've got Lawmatics, which attaches to right mm -hmm. the Clios and the in the law in the uh, practice Panthers and the smoke balls of the world, and of course get staffed up. So there we are. We're giving people yes. you know virtual assistance and marketing and all that helps. So I've got three amazing uh, sponsors. Rand, if people want to get in touch with you, they want to talk to you about what you do and check in with you. What are the best ways for them to reach you? 
Sure. They can go to mrsjunelegal.com or if you search in Google Attorney Whisper, I will pop up on LinkedIn, Facebook, all of the places. So uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. That's a really good spot. Um, if you don't have LinkedIn, check out mrsjunelegal.com. You can schedule with me there. You can sign up for our newsletter and just check out other podcasts as well. Yeah. And the saying is time is money and you're actually trying to help them with both right? Save time yeah. and get their freaking money in, you know, yeah, give me a break. Absolutely. So <laughs> that could it. be another thing for you. Time is money. You're, <laughs> you're on both ends. Um, yeah. But just thank you so much for, for coming back on the show, sharing your wisdom. I mean, I think everything that you and I spoke about can directly impact the time and money, right? Of the lawyers that are listening to improve their business and, and treat it more like a business and just spend less time you know, worrying about how to get the money in and just, and just come up with smarter ways to do it. So good stuff there. Yes. Thank you for having me. Oh, of course. Of course. All right. And thank you everybody for spending time with Rand and I today on the Be That Lawyer with Fretson podcast. We're having a great time and hopefully you are. And again, you know, getting some great takeaways to help you to be that lawyer, someone who's confident, organized, and a skilled rainmaker. Take care, everybody. Be safe, be well, and we will talk to you very soon. Uh -huh.